here as a product also. There, has, there is no beginning and no end. One, two, three, four, and the rest who are doing microservices are doing what? Microservices. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the buff this morning, I told that, yeah, yeah, you can do agile by being like uh, doing like talk in circle five minutes every morning. Still keep your project manager, so now it's Scrum Master, and it, you are doing agile. Sometimes I feel like microservices is, is the same stuff. Microservice is an organizational issue. It's an, sorry, it's an organizational solution to an organizational issue. It's not a technical solution to a technical issue. The only reason you should do microservice is because your development team is too big and they are, get, uh, they are stepping on each other's two while developing. That's the only reason. You need to split your code base into manageable chunks. That's the only reason. It's not, hey, we will get this. You've got a lot of issues with microservices. And I believe, really, that most organizations don't do microservices. They call it microservices. You can call it whatever you want. You might call them service schmervices. <laughs> but actually, you are, you are not doing microservices because you are not building a team around the microservice. And yeah, that's me, but I'm not the important guy here. This is this guy who is important. Who recognized this guy? Yeah. This is Mr. Conway. <laughs> Guys, I think the guy who does the pros production will be like super happy. OK, let's try something else. Now let's get back to Chrome. Chrome, I killed Chrome. Chrome is dead. No, it's there. OK. You know, I, I should get a medal after this talk. So basically, this guy is Conway, Mr. Conway or Dr. Conway, depending on how you want to look at things. And he like, thought about a theory, which basically means that your architecture, your software architecture, is constrained by the way your organization is designed. If you design a microservice, then you should have a team who is like autonomous. That's the definition of, yeah. Yeah, I know I feel your pain. But that's the definition of microservice, that you should build a small team, the two pizzas team, that are autonomous, that have all the required skills, so you should get developers, testers, sysadmins, whatever. You bring them together, they are autonomous. Remember this word, autonomous? Actually, that's what should be done. So basically, you have like in one team, you have a UX guy or UX guys and dev guys and QA guys, and DB guys, and perhaps also sysadmin, or whatever. That should be your goal, sorry. And in reality, this is what happens. Silos. We talked about it this morning during the buff. This is silos. So, among the people who are doing microservices, how many of you are organized like that, horizontally. No one. So, I will repeat the question. Among people who are doing microservices, how many of you are organized like that? Also no one, ah, no, a few hands. And all the others, they are too shy or? <laughs> because there were, the, there were a lot of people doing microservices before, when I asked the question, and now there are not that many. <laughs> so perhaps you are questioning and realizing that perhaps you are not doing really microservices. Yeah, that's an issue. 
because at the top of each silo there is a, a middle manager. The middle manager main responsibility is to approve your vacation request. And every year to be a proxy for your raise or not. Seems that you are like manager. I am just stating facts. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And the problem is that those middle managers, they all want to stay in their place, continuing to get a high pay for basically accepting your vacation request. So it's very hard to do microservices in, in or, like existing organization. And I think I'm afraid that most of people that think they are doing microservices because they are trying to apply the technical principle behind it, but not really that. And of course, you uh, have the, who remember this? <laughs> wow, a lot of people. I thought that was the, the old guy stuff, but uh, yeah. And it's not because you have a bad uh, monolith that just by migrating to microservices, everything is going to be rainbows and unicorns. And uh, hey, you know what I mean? So, this is just an introduction, but I will try not to use the term microservice because I think that it's completely out of scope. It's not the right semantics. I will use the term web service, which basically you can say you do. Yeah, we are an architecture of web services. Well, that's fine. Okay, and if you have a web service architecture, then something is going to happen and the pancake is going to land on the wrong side at one point or another. Probability. And this is what architects draw on the dashboard. This is a UML diagram. Yeah, I remind you of stuff you learned long ago and never used again. But this is what we do when you are, we are an architect. And everything is fine. But notice that this can be applied to an API call like from Java to Java inside your GVM, or it can be also applied to what? Web service call. And on dashboard, it's exactly the same. You call something, component A calls component B. However, it's a bit more complicated than that. And this is a reminder that what people wrongly believe about networking, about distributed computing. It's always super fun because, of course, when you design your stuff, you never think about this kind of stuff. And of course, <laughs> the network is not reliable at all. When you call an API, it's super easy. When you call a REST API or a web API, shit can happen. And here, this is my web service architecture. So I, I have two clients. I have a front service and a back service. And when everything is fine, I will make the call. It will get to F. Then it will get to B for, I don't know, enrichment or whatever. Then it gets back. But what happens if B is down, which probably would happen at some point in time. I mean, probably is not even. It will happen. Then I will make calls and what happened at some point that will be a huge traffic that will be get stuck on the front service. And after a point, F will also be down. And so you will have a contagion of all your architecture and your whole chain, pipeline chain will be down. And that's actually what you don't want to have. So to counter that problem, that specific problem, not every other problem, just the single one, you have the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker pattern is very akin to what you would do in an electricity circuit, that when you've got too strong a charge, a surge, I think it's called in English, then there is a circuit that opens and that breaks the flow and it keeps everything safe 
from the color perspective. Sorry. So basically, when everything is fine, the circuit is closed, you make the calls, you make the calls, you make the calls. At some point, you might fail, but let's say that for every failure, you count the number of failure. As long as the number of failure is not significant, it's not an issue. Because then you can still make calls and there won't be this huge red ball in front of your first microservice. However, if the backend service is down, then the threshold will be reached. And in that case, we will open the circuit breaker. At that point, we don't want to check whether it's good or not. We just fail fast. It's always a good principle in computer science if you want if you want to fail, you want to fail fast. And after some point in time, perhaps you want to check that it might be up again. So you will like be tentatively trying to make calls. If this works again, then you go to the close state again. If it fails again, well, you keep it open. And this can be strate strategically done. For example, you can double the time that elapses every time to count for the fact that, yeah, it's really, really, really down. Of course, meanwhile, you should have the monitoring system that tells you that something is wrong in your architecture. So as I said, you have a number of configuration options. And depending, again, on the implementation, you can say, hey, after five failed calls, then I will open the circuit breaker, or perhaps after 10, or perhaps after whatever. And the lapse time strategy, you can double, you can be fixed, and you can, open, uh, you can close it again, oh, sorry, uh, after a number of successive calls. I mean, those are configuration options that you need to think about. It's very dependent on the context. But the most important configuration option is what do you do when there is a timeout? What do you actually do when the circuit breaker is open? And I've been working in e-commerce and I like to, to take this example. Let's think about a, a, an e-commerce web shop. And you might have different services inside your web shop. Let's say, for example, you have a recommendation service. Like, you know, this stuff on Amazon. People who bought this also bought this. Huh? You want upselling because you want to sell a lot of stuff. Uh, you might have a service that is dedicated to pricing, to quotes. So you will ask the service, hey, the, the customer wants this product. How much should it cost? It can be uh, like time dependent. It can be location dependent. It can be, I don't know. You want to sell this product, so uh, the, the business guys, they, they just have a discount of whatever. Or, Of course, at the end, you have a permanent service because you want people to actually pay for your product. And probably as a technical way to get you like information, you also have a login service. <laughs> it will be expurged anyway, I know. They don't want to have like those fucking foreigners swearing in Russians on a conference talk. <laughs> anyway, so the easiest way is logging. Um, basically, when you are doing logging, you might call a service, but you actually don't expect um, a, a, an, a, an answer, a response. So it probably will be fire and forget. If the microservice is down, you don't care that much. And probably you, you will be making asynchronous calls for performance reasons anyway. So this one is super easy. Just forget about it. It's fine. No fallback. Recommendation. Recommendation, probably you might want to have something that is synchronous because when the guy buys something or, or puts something in, in his basket, probably you, you don't want to wait like 30 seconds to display. You, you want something right now on the wait page. However, it's not mandatory. It's just like nice to have. So in that case, depending again, 
it's very contextual, the business might decide that, okay, if something fails, then there is nothing. We don't show any recommendation. Or on the opposite, we can like have a static set of recommendation products that we want to sell in most of the cases. So it won't be adapted to what the guy really choose, but that's not very important. Pricing. Again, this should be synchronous. You cannot wait for the pricing to come. You must have it right now because you need to display it to the customer. This is required. You cannot have no price. However, most of the time, the business guy would prefer to sell at a slightly outdated price than no selling at all. So you can have a strategy that, I don't know, cash the prices when you get them, whether it's in memory or it's in a, like a NoSQL data store that is local to your service to whatever, or I don't know, a shared, uh, a, a shared uh, data store, but actually it's better than not sending at all. So in that case, you must think about what is the best fallback. And payment, yeah, payment is required. It's also synchronous if you want to be sure that actually it's not a fraud. Depending on the business will, is willing to take risk or not, you might accept asynchronous payments, meaning that, yeah, we will wait until we get an answer. That's up to you. You might get bad payments or whatever. So those are different kinds of services. And as you can see, every one of them has a different way to handle it. And actually, you can divide them into two different categories. The one that we want to fail fast and we don't care that much, or the one that rely on business logic for their fallback. For the first part, it's a black box. We don't care what happens inside and basically they can be handled by proxies or service meshes. On the white box side where actually we need to be, sorry, we need to be smart about it, we need to rely on libraries. And Istrix is one of such library it has, for, for those who is using Istrix already, a few people, um, you, you know that it's now not in development anymore. It has been superseded by uh, Resilience 4G. However, the Istrix dashboard is really cool. And I don't know if Resilience 4G has the same features for now. So, and also it's super well integrated into Spring Cloud, which is very good. So this is what uh, the definition of service mesh states on the Nginx site. I won't repeat it. You have probably been on the buff. You have read about it. So basically, everything that is not completely business, you want your service to have a single responsibility principle. You don't want to service to handle a lot of stuff. Everything that is cross-cutting concern, you push it to a service mesh and it handles that in a very efficient way. And right now, the cool kid on the block is Istio, and Istio is open source. It leverages Kubernetes, and who is not doing Kubernetes those days? I mean, everybody must say that you are, is doing Kubernetes, even if you are not. Um, and actually, it's quite easy to use because it uses a side called pattern that I also mentioned this morning. So basically, you don't need to explicitly tell, hey, I want to deploy like this Envoy proxy on my uh, pod. It will be done uh, on my node, sorry. It will be done automatically when you, you deploy a real business logic image. And there is the Envoy proxy under the hood that is developed by Lyft, IBM, and Google, if I'm, my memory is correct. So basically, it's quite good product. And from a bird's eye view, you have deployed this service in an image and automatically there is 
this proxy that is deployed through the sidecar and the service A doesn't talk to the service B, every network communication goes through the envoy proxy. So you can intercept and do whatever you want. Yeah, this is a sidecar pattern. So if you don't know nothing about Kubernetes and nothing about Istio, you go on the website, you check circuit breaker, which for the fun stuff has been renamed destination rule, which is not so fun, but yeah, shit happens. Um, and you have like four parameters that are interesting. As I told you before, the number of consecutive errors before like opening the circuit breaker, the interval between two checks, like if those errors happen in less than 10 seconds, they will be counted, otherwise it's, it's good enough. I mean, it's the, 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 the rolling window. Uh, the duration of the opening, and something that is also very interesting, interesting is the number or the percentage of like containers that will be kicked. Because you must remember that when we are doing this kind of architecture, there is not one single instance of a service. There is a pool of service in a cluster. So you have nodes. And at some point in time, you are not perhaps really sure how many of them are really down or not. It might be a general outage or not, but it's better to have a small pool of perhaps uh, badly uh, working containers than no containers at all. So you might want to eject them, but perhaps you don't want to reach 100%. You might want to keep some of them. So in that case, you might say, okay, I will kick them out until I reach 80% of the number of nodes in the cluster. And at that point, I stop because it cannot be worse than that anyway. And that's where the problem lies uh, when you say we want to have uh, Istio that is a secret breaker pattern is basically it's not good if you want to have fallback. The only thing with Istio, you can say fail fast and get me five or errors. So that still means that if your calling service receives five or O, it needs to handle that in some way. Or you don't care again about uh, the, the fallback. Like, A, it's a recommendation. I don't need nothing. If I have an error, I don't show any recommendation. And that's fine. The good thing about this approach is that you can think about it later. You don't need to design for Istio for that. You just deploy through Kubernetes and then you um, um, realize that you have a problem because you didn't think about this secret breaker. So you just implement it right now in like a few seconds of configuration. So that's a good positive sign. On the other side, you have Istrix, which basically is a library. So it's like code friendly. It's provided by Netflix. And as I said, it's in maintenance mode and it has been replaced, but it's still more recognized and will be used still, uh, I think, because there is a bit of lagging behind. So if you want to, who here already used Istrix? I saw four hands before, yeah, oh, more now. Okay, six, perhaps some people woke up. Meanwhile, um, so basically you wrap your calls into so-called comments. You have a class for that, Histrix comment. And those comments are run asynchronously from a thread pool. And then you can measure success and failures. And because of that, then you can implement the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker is also very interesting because then you have fallback logic in that case. So you can decide if I've got an, uh, an error, what happens? Istrix is super complex, I think, because you have got a lot of configuration options. For example, uh, the number of thread pool available, the, the, the number of the, the size of the buffer in the thread pool, this kind of stuff. And you need to fine tune it for every context in a very different way. So I don't think you can design beforehand for Istrix. You should use like good values, default values, and then tune it 
in production until you reach the right, um, the right result. Also, the problem of Hystrix, since it's a white box thing, it has no clue about the topology. It just knows which service it calls, which URL, which endpoint. But whether this is a virtual IP, this is, there is a cluster of nodes behind or whatever, it doesn't know anything. And also, Estrix is like integrated into Spring Cloud Netflix, so which also offers all the services. So if you are using Spring, your Spring Cloud, it's quite nice. Okay, let's do a demo. I won't do a demo of Istio. I will do a simple demo of Istrix. And I have actually two services. I have a Spring Boot application that actually does the pricing of a product. And as you can see, the business logic is super complicated. It's a hash code of the, of the like, product code that I receive. And then I, I jitter it a bit just to have something that is always around the same stuff. And I introduce some failures. So basically, after I will have a grace count that everything works fine. And after a time, it will start failing. And it will fail a lot. Sorry, on the other hand, I have this service. And that is the caller of the pricing. This is the shop. And basically, it gets a product ID and it asks for a quote to the pricing service. And here I'm using Spring Cloud. So I have this Strix command. And the super good stuff is that I don't need to create a new object every time. I just use this and say, the fallback method is get quote from cache. Here I have a very, very simple cache. It's in memory cache. It's what you don't want in production. There is no eviction, no nothing. It just works. Any question about the code? And yeah, I did it in Kotlin, of course. Which makes Mark happy yes. because he had to work in Java before. Okay. So let's try it. I will, sorry, I will first start the pricing service. So no Docker, no Kubernetes, just simple services on my machine. So here I have the pricing application and now I have the shop application that will be calling the pricing application. So if I want to try it, I will just call the product service with this product ID. And so this is my first call. The grass count is still not down. So here I get the real price of the service, the price that is up to date and it tells me that it comes from a service. So it's not that fun, so let's add something to it. And I will open the Istrix dashboard and I will monitor the service itself. And here it's this one. Yes. Nothing happens, no calls, no nothing. And I've created a little script. Very little script. So basically what I'm doing is I'm constantly curling on this product foobar stuff. And I will run it. And let's see what happens. So now the grace count is still counting, so I get real updated prices. And at some point, what will happen? Yeah, you can see it. it. There was a bit of lagging. 
and now I get the stuff from the cache. Interestingly enough, you might notice that sometimes what happens is here, for example, whoops, here, uh, you, you see that two calls, the result from the cache is different. That shouldn't be normal. However, if you check the code behind it, I mean, even if I, I, I have a fallback, since it's asynchronous, I still apply the price I got from the service, if even after it's late and I fill in the cache. So that's the reason why sometimes the cache is refreshed, even though it still gets the price from the cache. And on the Istrix dashboard site, you've got this kind of stuff. So here you can see that, yeah, I've got a lot of, sorry, I've got a lot of calls that are not working. So the yellow I might be a bit small. So the, the yellow one are those that are timeouts and the violet one, purple one are rejected. But you, you see here that the circuit is still closed because my configuration is not that great, perhaps, according to this use case. So what I will be doing, I will st start hammering through that and I will send second client. Second client doesn't do much better. You know, I've got a lot of rejected stuff again, but again, configuration is not adapted to that. Of course, I've got a lot of, of failing stuff. Once in a while, I get one green because every, I don't think, I, I think it's one in every five, I've got uh, something that succeeds. And so let's keep hammering again. So now there are three clients that are repeatedly looping and curling the clients. And here you see in something in blue appeared and now the time is decreasing a lot. And now of, of course it's, it's again open and now it's open again and you can see the time decreasing again, the time, because I've got a lot of fail fast and then I've got a very, very fast answer. Of course, that's not, this kind of, of, of curve is not what you want in production, but here it's because my service, my pricing service, I mean, I have built-in failure inside of it, so that's probably not what you want to achieve. But I think it's interesting that here you can see, for example, the, the blue one are the number of requests that basically like fail fast and return the cache stuff. That's what you want. If something bad happens in your pressing service, you want the shop service to fail, to, you want it, sorry, you want the shop service to fail fast and to return a cache result. And this protects your microservice architecture because even though one of your service is badly designed, then you still get your service. The customers can still do his shopping. You can still get money out of it. And at two clients, then it will be closed forever because I, 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 I don't have enough. Uh, I didn't adapt the configuration enough. Hey, don't make me lie. Stop. Mm -hmm. Did I shut it down or? So now I have one. Yes, okay. Now it should work. Okay. Sorry. So, thanks for your attention. Um, here is my blog. Here is my Twitter account if you want to follow me. 
very interestingly, here is the Git repository that I just showed you about the pricing and the shop. And here is the article that is the talk in more detail where I go a bit deeper into some subjects. So takeaway of this talk is probably you are, on, you are not doing microservices. You are doing web services, semantics. Second is you should take care about failure in your architecture and the circuit breaker pattern is one way to handle failure. Third takeaway, Istio cannot replace Istrix. It depends on the context. It depends on the typology of your service. So if you want to externalize your um, circuit breaking uh, fallback logic, don't use Istio because it's not made for that. It's for basically services that don't have any fallback logic that you, you don't need to handle. Any questions? 